Hi. Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our first webinar of the Crude Move webinar series entitled Crude Oil Transport in the Great Lakes Basin. These webinars are an initiative of the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network. I'm Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory. And joining me today are Dale Bergeron of Minnesota Sea Grant and Dr. Brad Hall of John Carroll University. We're delighted to have them here today to talk about crude oil transport in the Great Lakes. Uh, but before we get started, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I will collect and pose your questions out to Dr. Hall at the end of his presentation. We have a great group uh, on this webinar, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and across the country. Please keep those questions uh, coming throughout the presentation, and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Uh, also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. So please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand over the mic to, Dr. to Dale Bergeron of uh, Minnesota Sea Grant. Dale. Uh, thank you very much, Jill. Um, before we get started, I just want to add something quickly. This is a, a joint effort by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network and the Great Lakes Commission in presenting this information. And so that's very important, and we're real pleased to be working with them to share new information and uh, best practices. Um, I'm also going to start with a bit of a disclaimer, because we're not advocating anything specific in terms of policy through this effort. What we're trying to do is share information, best practices, ongoing research and management concepts that can help create an informed uh, stakeholder uh, group that can then choose wise policy design. So we're going to do the best we can to share information and everything's on the table. Uh, as we move forward, this is, as Jill said, this is our first effort. Um, we're going to be moving into understanding hazards, risks, and security spill response requirements and regional capacity, and finally looking at regulatory requirements and activities, research activities in particular, for creating tools for addressing multiple objectives simultaneously. And with that, I'll say that one of the things that we're most interested in exploring is systems thinking. This is a very, very complex issue. Uh, it, it's a cross-cutting uh, concept that is crude oil use and movement, uh, cross-cuts economic, social, and environmental issues in very dramatic ways. And so what I want you to think about is something called systems thinking. It's fundamentally different from traditional forms of analysis, which focus on breaking down issues into individual pieces. Systems thinking actually seeks to expand an issue, accounting simultaneously for multiple interactions being studied and focuses on relationships and interdependent process. So what I'm going to do now is uh, introduce to you Dr. Bradley Hull. Uh, he's with John Carroll University, um, where he is an associate professor in the Department of Management, Marketing, and Logistics. He has approximately 30 years of experience in logistics and activities in dealing with crude oil movement and refined products and chemicals not only in the Great Lakes Basin, but throughout North America, from the Gulf of Mexico over to the uh, West Coast, and again, all the way across to the East Coast. Um, we really couldn't have a person with a broader understanding uh, of the issues of what's moving and where. And he's going to take some time and, and share some, uh, some thoughts with you uh, and some slides of, about what's going on in the United States and, and how it impacts the Great Lakes Basin. He's also a consultant and, and, and published many articles as well in Transportation Journal, the Journal of Transportation Research. He's worked both on the U.S. and Canadian side and, uh, again, has consulted on many important regional pro pro projects. Um, so I'll turn this over to Dr. Hull. Okay. Well, thank you, Dale. Thanks for the nice introduction. And uh, well, welcome, everybody. 
Um, so today we're going to talk, we'll talk about crude oil movement in the Great Lakes Basin, and it's primarily going to be a talk about crude oil logistics, you know, how it moves into the Great Basin and, uh, and things like that. So uh, let me advance, start advancing the slides here. I want to start with the conclusion, uh, the main points that we're trying to make here. Uh, first point I'd like to make is that, uh, first of all, uh, crude oil moves into the Great Lakes Basin by quite a variety of methods. The, uh, it's a very complex network. Uh, it's been around for many years. It's been around for more than 100 years. It keeps changing. And it's a very important network because we definitely need crude oil here in the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, the next point I want to make is that if we, say, shut down any one route uh, coming into the Great Lakes Basin or relied on the others, there can be lots of unintended consequences. And the, the good part of the talk is going to be uh, what might those consequences be? Uh, the, the overall goal, though, is to make the point that to come up with the very best crude oil routes, uh, the routes that are going to be socially, environmentally, economically the best, is going to take really a team approach involving people from many disciplines. So with, uh, with no further ado, I'll begin, begin with the uh, presentation. Uh, here's the outline. <clears throat> First of all, I'm going to talk for about five minutes just about what is the importance of crude oil to the basin. Uh, next, I want to talk about, I want to describe this complex network and that's, uh, and talk about some of the routes because there are many routes that are contested. And that'll be sort of the first half of the presentation. Uh, then I want to get into the unintended consequences because there's some really uh, uh, interesting ones actually and then uh, conclude with a proposal to move forward. So that's, that's what I'm planning to do. So first of all, we'll start really simply. The life cycle of oil. Oil starts at, uh, you know, an oil well somewhere, and then it moves to uh, an oil refinery, uh, moves by pipeline or it moves by ship or moves by truck, moves by rail car, but it has to get there. <coughs> And then at a refinery, uh, the refineries primarily make fuels, uh, transportation fuels. And there, there's a list of them that you see, gasoline, di diesel, jet, that makes asphalt, coke. Uh, but another thing, oil refineries are typically or frequently associated with petrochemical plants, which make a lot of, uh, have a lot of industrial residential uses. Uh, as example, I used to work <coughs> in Lima, Ohio where there is a refinery and chemical plant. And our refinery in Lima, Ohio, did a really good job of making the fuels. And in fact, we were noted for making a very high quality of coke that had many industrial uses. Uh, but also, right next to the Lima plant, there were some petrochemical plants. And one of the streams that they made was they made a product called acrylonitrile, which is the main building block for acrylic fibers. So it's a very important product. Another uh, product that they made was uh, anhydrous ammonia and urea, which are really central to the whole corn belt and uh, the farm communities. And there were a whole variety of other uses. There were chemicals that went into pharmaceuticals, chemicals that went into paints, all sorts of catalysts. And so that's, uh, uh, so, so here's just sort of a quick summary, this next slide. It's just a picture of what are the uses of oil. Is oil important? And the answer is sure it is. Uh, you can see, I, I don't think I'll go through these with you because you can just look at them there on the slide. <clears throat> They're used for solvents, paints, glue, synthetic rubber, pesticides, all those things. And, uh, but there are many residential uses. Uh, in particular, the uh, picture at the bottom left is a picture I found. It's a, it's a Canadian picture, and it shows uh, all the potential home uses of, uh, of crude oil derivatives there. So the point is, the point of this slide is that crude oil permeates our daily lives. That's about it. So it's very central to us. Now, what about uh, crude oil in the basin? Let's, let's get more toward the basin now. Uh, first of all, 
where are these refineries? Well, here's a slide that I'm not going to spend much time on. Uh, if you just look at this, you'll see there are all the circles. There are a lot of refineries in the United States. Uh, you can see that there tend to be a lot of them on the Gulf Coast, Houston, uh, uh, New Orleans. But that tends to be where they are. There are some on the East Coast. But surprisingly, perhaps, uh, you will note that there are a lot of them in the Great Lakes Basin. And so I'm going to immediately move to the next slide because I really want to talk about the refineries in the basin here because that's our topic today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank CPCS. They're a Canadian consulting company that contributed this slide. This slide came from one of their earlier studies. And I'd uh, uh, like to just quickly talk about these. Uh, here's Montreal at the edge of the basin. Now, Montreal has refining and it also has a very substantial chemical sector uh, that makes a lot of these uh, uh, final products. Uh, moving down here, there, there's another one in Nanticoke. It's right by the, uh, not, not too far in the Niagara Falls area. Uh, down in uh, Akron Canton, Ohio, there's a refinery. And also that area is known as the polymer, polymer Valley of the United States, which is where a lot of polymers are created. And those things are, you know, have a crude oil connection as well. Then when you move over to the west side of the state, uh, there's my circle, Lima, Ohio, where I worked. And uh, just above it is two more refineries in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, and so that's an entire corridor, a refining corridor and, and chemical plants. And then you can move up into, you know, Detroit. Uh, and then, of, of course, you know, Chicago is always going to be a very big uh, refining chemical facility. So, so you can see that uh, essentially oil and chemical are critical industry in the Great Lakes. They are actually a, a significant source of jobs. And uh, to, for this system to operate well, it really needs a secure supply of low-cost oil. So that means the oil should come from low-cost sources and the transportation should be as low-cost as possible so that our products in the Great Lakes Basin can be as competitive as possible. So that pretty much concludes my introduction to the oil business. And uh, now, on to the uh, second part. Uh, second part is I want to tell you about, I'm going to start off with the history of the oil business and the history of this network, this big crude oil delivery network, because it's a fascinating history. Uh, it's one that I've, you know, been familiar with for, uh, you know, years working in the industry and years as a professor uh, at John Carroll University. So I'm going to talk about the history and bring you right up currently to what's happening in, with, with this network. Okay, here's uh, not exactly the beginning of time, but we'll go back to the 70s and 80s. In the 70s and 80s and before then, the United States was pretty much energy independent. Uh, this big circle here, uh, we, we produced an awful lot of oil in Oklahoma, Texas, and the surrounding areas. And in fact, this area produced so much oil that it actually shipped oil down to the Gulf Coast refineries because, as you saw before, there are many refineries down there, so it fed those refineries. And it also fed the basin refineries. So there were pipelines emanating from the center of the uh, oil patch uh, all over. So that was, those were our days of uh, energy independence. Uh, so what happened uh, after the 1980s? Well, unfortunately, the oil dried up. And at that point, uh, we needed somebody, uh, we needed a rescue of some sort uh, where we needed other supplies of oil uh, to, you know, keep our basin refineries going and to keep the Gulf Coast refineries going. So now we'll go to uh, the more recent future. Who came to the rescue? Well, there were two parties who came to the rescue. The first was the Canadians. 
And here is the uh, Canadian pipeline network. You know, they had always delivered some oil into the system, but not not that much. And actually, there and the other one is imports. Well, there had actually always been some imports, but not that much. So these were the two uh, increases in oil. Uh, first of all, uh, the Canadians started uh, developing more oil, expanding the Enbridge pipeline system, and regularly serving Minneapolis, Chicago, Ohio refineries, Sarnia. And uh, and by the same, and you know, Canada is a friendly country, so that's a, a good supply of oil. Uh, we also wound up with an awful lot of oil coming in from uh, from foreign sources. And oftentimes, if the foreign countries that were supplying us oil were countries that were uh, hostile toward us or didn't like us. I guess that's probably a better way to say it. But uh, so how did the oil industry respond? What about our pipeline network? How did our pipeline network respond? Well, a lot of the pipelines which, you know, had started in Texas and Oklahoma, uh, were reversed and went down to the Gulf Coast. Uh, they were reversed. Uh, like uh, this pipeline here that you're looking at is called the Seaway Pipeline. It had gone down to the Gulf Coast and they turned it around. So that they, you know, turned the uh, engines around so that it operated the other direction. And the same with many other pipelines. So all of a sudden there was a big change to our complex network. Uh, some pipelines were reversed and there were other new build pipelines. Uh, and with the Enbridge system, there were more pipelines added uh, to Im improve the flow of oil. So, but in this case, uh, we essentially lost our energy independence, and we became more dependent on energy. Okay, now this, this brings us up to today, uh, the 20 teams. Uh, the 20 teens have seen yet another huge change in the oil industry, and it's amazing to see these changes. Uh, this has been the era of the oil sands. We've got uh, the, uh, you know, the bitumen, <clears throat> the tire sands of Alberta. We've got uh, up here, we've got uh, the Bakken oil down here in North Dakota that's come on strong. And we've got Eagleford down in Texas. Uh, which has come on strong as well. So we're actually moving back toward energy independence, which is always a good thing because, uh, you know, we uh, we don't want to be reliant on other sources of crude oil. And if we are, it seems like Canada is our is our best supplier. Uh, they, we've always had a friendly relationship with Canada. So uh, again, with this, there has been. More, more pipelines have been reversed, more pipelines have been built, because now, if you'll take a look at these pipelines, the Canadian oil and the Bakken actually can move down to the Gulf Coast. So, and it's de displacing, and it's displacing, you know, it's displacing the imports. So uh, some of the oil moves across to, towards Chicago and then down, there, there are many ways it happens, uh, but that's that's how it's been. So, um, so anyway, we essentially the, my point is that we're working our way back toward almost energy independence. All right. Uh, now another thing has happened. Uh, in this in this time frame, and that is that uh, oops. Okay, here it is. Uh, essentially, the uh, this this tar sands has come on so quickly that uh, not all the oil has been moved by pipeline. Uh, essentially, a lot of oil has been moved by rail. Uh, both from Canada uh, and from uh, the Bakken, and actually Eagleford as well. Uh, a lot of oil is moving by rail, and that's 
primarily a reflection of the fact that the pipelines have not been able to keep pace with uh, the, the new types of oil. Plus, the location of the oil has been located in you know areas that are more hard to uh, collect it into a pipeline spot. And uh, if you if you look at this, you'd say uh, uh, as far as the basin goes, uh, again. We can look at uh, Chicago, and we can look at Cleveland, because one of the main rail routes for all this oil that's been coming by rail has been actually through the basin on its way to the East Coast. Certainly, a lot of the crude does stop off in our refineries here in the Great Lakes Basin, but a significant amount has moved toward Albany and then down the Hudson River toward the East Coast refineries. So uh, that's a picture of the basic system overall, and uh, the, the uh, pipelines. So I think the point, the takeaway point from this whole section of the presentation, is that the pipeline system is, is a constantly evolving system. It's been around for a hundred years, and but it does make many changes. It, it does adapt itself to the market situations, and it will doubtlessly continue to do this in the future. Okay, now at, at issue is uh, contested pipelines. Uh, there, there are uh, a number of contested routes, and uh, I'd like to uh, describe those to you. And so that's going to be the purpose of the next uh, few minutes here. Uh, first of all, to, to start talking about some of the contested routes, I'm going to look at just a smaller pipeline picture. Uh, here we're looking at uh, the Western Canadian pipeline proposals. Uh, these are the proposals for uh, new construction for new pipelines. And as you can see, uh, they're pretty much all, the X there means that there is a, uh, it's a contested pipeline. Uh -huh. This pipeline right here is, is uh, has not been constructed and is uh, significantly opposed by First Nations, by uh, some of the uh, governments. Uh, the one down below, this is the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, which, as you folks doubtlessly know, has been uh, stopped. It's not, uh, not active. Uh, there's another one going out to the west coast of Canada, which is strongly opposed. And in fact, uh, this one is Trans Mountain Pipeline, it's uh, been active for many years, uh, back into the 80s and 90s even, and it takes oil from Edmonton down to the Vancouver area. But there's been a proposed expansion to move some more of the uh, Canadian oil down, down to uh, water, and the expansion is being, is being opposed. So, um, Question is, what's what's the impact of that on the basin? You know, because that's that's our main focus here is, is the basin. Well, as these pipeline routes are blocked, uh, the oil still wants to move to market, and the the uh, Great Lakes Basin needs a secure, low cost source of crude oil. So uh, it is it is possible that we would see more railroad moves down into the Great Lakes Basin. Or they would try to move by another pipeline, you know, primarily the Enbridge system. Here's a little more detail of the contested pipelines. And uh, looking at that picture, you see this is a significant pipeline network. It's got many, many legs about it. And, you know, most of the new build pipelines, uh, there are lots of protests out there. And so, uh, Again, uh, the, our, our basin needs to secure low costs of source of crude oil. Uh, if, say, uh, somehow all these pipelines that you're looking at with the X's on them were either shut down or not built, uh, you would seriously compromise uh, the flow of oil. It would have to be significantly redirected into the Great Lakes Basin. So, the point is, there are 
lots and lots of possibilities. You know, some of these routes would be less environmentally desirable, some would be more environmentally desirable, but it seems like these should all be evaluated. Okay, and now, so, so those are my points uh, to date. Uh, they have the, the, all these contested pipelines do have the ability to disrupt the flow of oil into the Great Lakes Basin. Now, uh, concern that I have, uh, what, is, what is the concern? The concern is that if we shut down a particular link in the oil flow, there can be unintended consequences. And so what I'd like to talk to you about now is what exactly are those unintended consequences. Okay, got to find it here. Whoops. Sorry. Wrong button. Okay. Uh, this is a too complicated picture. I tried to make it as simple as humanly possible. Uh, and I'd like to go through it by giving you some examples. Suppose that we decide that, say, one of those contested pipelines, we decide to either not build it or, if it's an operating pipeline, just shut it down. What are the consequences? Well, uh, one consequence could be that uh, if you're shutting down one route, uh, the basin still needs the oil, so it'll just come in by another route. So the uh, issue would be if it's coming by pipeline, maybe it'll come by another pipeline route. And the question would be, is that other pipeline route preferable to the, uh, to the first or not? Other thing that could happen is maybe it doesn't come by another pipeline route. Maybe it would come by another mode. It could come by rail. Is that preferable or not? Another option is it could come by water. It could come by water on the Great Lakes. And I'm going to talk to you more about uh, water on, by, on the Great Lakes shortly here. But is that preferable or is that not preferable? These are all things that need to be evaluated. Then, uh, you know, suppose that uh, we're talking about not just redirecting oil, but we're, we're talking about restricting the flow from, say, Canada and the Bakken into, uh, into the basin. Well, if we're restricting the flow, what can happen? Uh, number one, we might import uh, crude oil from foreign countries and bring them up that old system that you saw in the history slides. Uh, that system is still there. It still works. Uh, I don't know its capacity anymore because some of the lines have been reversed. But, um, and is that preferable? Uh, essentially, if you're not going to bring in your low-cost source of oil, which is going to be probably the Canadian or the Bakken, you'll have to pay more to get oil from elsewhere. And where are we going to get the oil from? Uh, source it from friendly countries, hopefully. Uh, but actually, uh, an, yet another feature uh, would be uh, if we cannot bring into enough oil into the basin, then what we would do is we would try to bring refined products into the basin. And uh, so we would essentially not be using the basin refineries as much we would be bringing products in from the outside. How, how might we do that? Well, uh, oh, okay, and I, I'm sorry, I guess, I guess I got ahead of myself a little bit here. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump ahead. Let's, let's talk about refined products since we're talking about it right now. Uh, here's a map of, the, of our beloved basin, and I've marked on it 
the refineries. Uh, there's refineries in Chicago, refineries, you know, in Toledo, refineries in Sarnia, refineries in Mo refinery in Montreal. Uh, there actually already are refined products movements on the Great Lakes. Uh, there is there aren't too many in U.S. waters. Uh, the Green Bay does receive some degree of refined products by barge. Uh, for the most part, it tends to be more Canadian refined products movements because the Canadian refineries are located here in Montreal and they're located here in Sarnia. And yet throughout Canada, Thunder Bay, Sault Ste. Marie, many other places, they need refined products. And Canada doesn't have the extensive pipeline system we have in the United States. So they tend to have more of a maritime system of delivery, which seems to have worked fine over the years. So uh, we could bring in more refined products into the Great Lakes if we needed to. Uh, otherwise, uh, how else would we bring in refined products? Well, we're, we're back to square one. Here is a different pipeline map. This is a map of the refined products pipelines in the U.S. And I'm afraid I'm confusing you by providing so many maps here. But uh, just, just so you know, within the United States, refined products move in good part by pipeline. And so we would have the ability to bring up more refined products from the Gulf Coast refineries and distribute them throughout the basin by pipeline. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a pipeline network. So is that preferable to providing just the crude oil to our own refineries? That, that becomes the question. Now, I just skipped by uh, my one slide. I'll, I'll pick that up here. So uh, this is a project which has currently been shelved. Uh, it was a project that, to load, uh, and, you know, this is due to, you know, in part, pipeline bottlenecks uh, to load a crude oil into barges or small ships and then deliver them through the Great Lakes uh, by water. So if, if there aren't, the point is that people look at the potential of moving crude oil by water and there are several different uh, projects that people are looking at right now. But um, that would be probably an alternative to a uh, pipeline. So those are the consequences, and these last ones are sort of the more unintended consequences, all of which can happen. So this concludes the main part of my talk. Uh, my, I was mainly trying to describe the system to you. Uh, first point. Uh, crude oil routes, crude oil is very important to the basin. It's a source of jobs, it's a source of industry, it's a source of, uh, it's a source of, uh, you know, our economy. It's very important. The pipelines that deliver it are a very complicated network which are constantly evolving on their own. Many of these routes are contested. And shutting down any one route can have lots of unintended consequences. So that's uh, the point at which we say, really, it would be nice if we could get a bunch of stakeholders representing all disciplines, environmental, social, government, uh, even the oil industry, uh, which is trying to move oil by least cost, and uh, see if we can't reach uh, some sort of uh, Best, best routes to move the oil by. Well, here's my sort of my final slide. So here's the proposal. The proposal would be that we would develop a model. Uh, it would be a substantial computer model, uh, which would have input. It would describe the entire network. It would describe the oil opportunities. It would include uh, railroad options, water options, and all of them and would have lots of inputs on the safety, on the environmental impacts, 
on greenhouse gases. And, uh, and we would use that model, sort of an interdisciplinary team, to come up with the best possible routes. So that this way things don't just happen on their own, but they have a little more guidance uh, toward economic, social, and environmental goals. So I thought I'd end this talk with a quote from Buckminster Fuller. Uh, you never change things by fighting existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's what I would hope uh, this computer model would do. That would be the idea. So, so thank you very much uh, for listening to me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm going to turn this back over to uh, Dale and Jill. And that's my name, and that's my contact information, if you'd like to get in touch with me further. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hall. We have uh, several questions, so let me just uh, let me get started and ask Dr. Sure. Hall as many as we can. Um, the first question that we have is, how does the density of refineries and pipelines in the Midwest compare to what's happening in other parts of the country? Well, uh, the density of the number of refineries. Uh, let, let me go back to the, the former slide here. Hold on. Uh, that's the picture. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up again. You can see that the, the primary density of refineries is on the Gulf Coast, right right there. Uh, Port Arthur, Houston, uh, down here, that's Corpus Christi. Uh, there's, there's New Orleans. That's where the main refinery centers, refinery centers are. Then there are refinery centers, you know, here on the east coast of the U.S. And, uh, of course, uh, in, in fact, uh, I'm not sure this uh, circle is large enough, uh, but Southern California has a big refining area. Uh, now, the, the, the West, uh, the Rocky Mountains area, does not have that many refineries. And uh, I think we, we have refineries uh, here in the Midwest and in the basin because uh, well, to begin with, we have a high density of people. So you find the refineries where you find the high density of people. But also, we're where the refining industry grew up, Titusville, Pennsylvania. Um, the oil initially, the oil industry originally started here in the basin. Uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania, down into Lima, uh, all over this area was oil country at one time. Can I jump in here? Sure. Okay. I, I would just also toss out that, you know, we, we've only – touched on what's going on where in this particular um, presentation. But one of the issues that we didn't discuss much about was national security. And so there's always the issue of when you have a cluster of refining capacity within the Gulf where hurricanes are a common occurrence and a Category 5 hurricane could cause major damage to a, a numerous refineries or the capacity of moving oil either to or from those refineries. And so part of the distribution of refineries has to do with national security issues as well. So it's very difficult right now um, to really assess, uh, as, as Dr. Hull pointed out, what is security? What are we trying to achieve? And how do we optimize, again, across environmental, economic, and social good? Thanks, both of you. I, we have a couple other questions. Um, has ending the crude oil export embargo changed the oil transportation pattern? Uh, the, the, there has been export of crude oil, just to stay on this current slide, there has been some export of crude oil uh, mainly from the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, it's such a new issue that uh, it hasn't really changed much of anything. 
uh, you know, the, it's been, that's an issue that's, you know, the, the embargo was lifted not too long ago, so I don't think that there's been much response yet. And I think the price of crude oil on the international market uh, makes it highly unlikely that it's going to have a major impact until that price level changes. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the consumption of oil, the volume of uh, crude oil imports? Are they increasing or decreasing within the Great Lakes Basin, the volume of crude oil imports? Well, I, I, I don't have statistics uh, in front of me here. Uh, I, I do know, uh, let's see, to... Uh, see, uh, the Great Lakes Basin used to be served uh, – whoops, hold on, I'm ha having trouble switching slides here. Okay, here, the, the Great Lakes Basin used to be served by this line coming up. That was called Cap Line. That was one of our big tie lines. Uh, this was uh, – uh, there, there was a whole bunch of them. That's a mobile line. That one's called Mid-Valley. Uh, we used a lot of these uh, lines. Now our supply has shifted, and it's largely uh, – there's largely uh, – there's a lot of Canadian crews. So there's a lot more Canadian crew that's come in. Uh, so it's it's reduced. You know, the, the foreign imports have reduced and they've been replaced by Canadian. Um, we still get, you know, Texas oil because that Mid-Valley pipeline still gets into the state of Ohio. It comes into Lima, that's where it ends. Uh, so there is still – so there's some of the – there's even some of the uh, Eagleford oil which uh, gets up into Lima. but. Uh, my understanding is that the, the pipelines on the Gulf Coast that move imports north uh, do not have the volumes that they used to have, that there's a, there's a reasonable amount of volume open in them. I, I wish I had numbers to provide you. I just don't have them here right now. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Um, Another question that we had was, how does the age condition of pipelines factor into the model? Uh, this uh, person was asking, because uh, there was – there is a 1918 pipeline in St. Clair River that a company wants to reopen and use, um, according to a recent article in the Detroit Free Press. Um, do the researchers comment on these proposals, and if not, why? Uh, well, I'll tell you what I – my understanding is that the age is not that related to condition of the pipeline. Uh, now, just to back up a minute, though, uh, pipelines were built uh, initially you – know, the, the big pipeline era building was in right after World War II. Uh, right, right after World War II, what happened was when Eisenhower became president, he established the interstate highways to better connect us. The pipeline industry developed uh, most of these pipelines. And, uh, you know, Eisenhower also developed the St. Lawrence Seaway, you know, expanded the locks for commerce. So, so that was sort of the age of infrastructure. So that means that the pipelines in the United States are typically, you know, date back to like the 1950s. So they're, you know, 60 years old. Uh, Maybe maybe older than 60 years, but the, the point is that uh, when a pipeline is uh, put in the ground, it can be coated to retard rust. There's a cathodic protection system you can put on it so that a slight electric current retards rust. Uh, as pipelines operate, uh, pipeline companies are always putting uh, instruments through the pipelines to check for rust, to check for dents, to check for wall thickness. Uh, there's, they're called pipeline pigs, and there's quite a variety of pigs. There are 
uh, pig, there are radio pigs which emit radio signals. So pipeline companies do quite a lot of maintenance on pipelines. And uh, as far as the, uh, the, the leak history goes, uh, you know, my, my understanding is, you know, there, there may be some connection with age, but I, I think maintenance and, you know, as far as if there's a problem with the pipeline, if, you, if it's dug up, and if, uh, you know, if uh, the sections of it are replaced, it, sh it should be operable. But, but I, understand, I understand the concern there. Uh, we've got a couple of people asking um, if that's the, the case, then um, why are there um, so many pipeline bursts and spills then? Well, there are pipeline bursts and spills. Uh, you know, any kind of transport, first of all, any kind of transportation is going to have bursts and spills. Uh, the, uh, essentially, the, the track record of pipelines is the best. Uh, railroads, uh, you know, have uh, certainly more, more accidents than pipelines. Uh, there have been some famous uh, railroad spills. And, and truck spills typically are not recorded that much, uh, but I, th I think pipeline spills are known and they're written about and they're a concern because, uh, well, I mean, they're, they're a concern, but, uh, you know, the overall track record of the pipeline industry has been far better than the track record of the rail industry as far as spills go. I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump in. Right. I'm going to yeah. jump okay. in a minute and just say that in the future we're going to talk about understanding, perceiving uh, risk, hazards, and security across modes, and the way that an industry, as such as transportation, evaluates those things is very different sometimes uh, than, for example, a biologist might take a look at the issue, or um, a sociologist or an urban planner they would be looking at different things and even using slightly different terminology. So um, I guess what I would say is that in a very linear fashion, a very um, statistical way, when you take a look at pipelines, they're far superior in terms of million barrels moved, for example, uh, on the list of, of different modes of transportation. Maybe you just speak to that briefly, Dr. Hull. And, Oh, I mean, yeah, their, their, their record is far, far better than the other modes. Uh, it's questions not just of the, the accident, it's also is, if, if there's a spill, is it, uh, is it in a very, is it in a sensitive area? Uh, you know, on, on the one hand, pipelines can cross water. Uh, that's a problem. Uh, pipelines also, for the most part, uh, cross open country. Uh, railroads, go through population centers and that's a problem so it's it's also it's you know the uh, it's the record of the pipeline companies which overall is the best but it's also a question of where these pipelines are running and again past history is not what we want for the future and i think that that goes back to to dr hull's comment about can we be wiser can we look intelligently at what these different options really uh, offer us and what the threats are for, for the choices that we're making. And, and I think that's kind of uh, why we're trying to increase the level of awareness on this issue. And, and I think also, I think also that's sort of the thrust of the project. See, my, uh, my webinar today, the focus has been on explaining the crude oil network, describing what the issues are and things like that from a crude oil logistics point of view. You know, there, the other, you know, successive webinars are going to be dealing with the other issues as well. Uh, we have we have a question. I'm not I'm not completely sure if this is would be in your realm, so I'll just ask, and and uh, um, you can tell me it's not or can answer. Um, how does the type of oil each refinery? can handle affect 
the calculus of moving oil to different locations by different modes of transportation. Uh, well, the uh, uh, I, I can just talk generally. I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, but the uh, uh, in, you know I'm I, I guess I don't quite understand the question. Could you explain it again? Um, I, I think the question, Dr. Hall, has to do with uh, certain refineries are set up to process certain kinds of crude oil. Right. And so that interfaces with the available routes of the oil and the cost on those routes, and I think right. that's what is being alluded to. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Well, here, here, here's the thought then. See, in one of these crude oil pipelines, there's not just one type of oil that is moving. There are many. Uh, like in the Enbridge system, in an Enbridge pipeline, you would typically find, and it depends, it differs from pipeline to pipeline, but you would find, you'd find some heavy oil and you would find some lighter oil and they would be moving back to back. But that's the way the oil industry moves. And uh, after, even after a long, distance, those oils are still separated from each other. And so uh, that means that using one pipeline, the refinery can get a combination of heavy and light oils, whatever combination it needs. I think that's a general answer to your question. So it does not impact the calculus of moving oil that much. Now, if, like in the, in the case of the Bakken oil, uh, a lot of the Bakken oil is accessible only to rail, in which case you would have to receive it by rail. Uh, there are pipelines which have been proposed to uh, move the Bakken oil, but there's, there's, they are contested as well. So in that case, uh, whether you refine heavy or light oil, that does impact the calculus of whether you're going to receive rail cars of Bakken or can, can do that. But I think the overall answer to your question, and maybe the best answer, is that pipelines do move a variety of oil, and they can move light and heavy oils back to back in the same line. Okay, thank you. Um, another question uh, that we had gotten is, is there an incentive to develop new pipelines along existing routes rather than develop new routes? See, uh, what, what answer to your question is that sometimes with a pipeline, uh, if you want to increase its capacity, what you can do is you can uh, add more pumps along the way. A typical pipeline has pumps spaced out throughout its length, and so you could, you know, add more pumps along the length of the pipeline. It's an engineering calculation, but so with an existing pipeline, you can increase its flow. Um, another way you can increase the flow of a pipeline, and it, I mean, these all have limits. Another way you can increase the capacity of a pipeline is that you can, uh, there's a, a thing called drag reducing agent, known in, in the industry as DRA, and you can inject, inject that into the pipeline, and what it does is it essentially <clears throat> greases the inside of the pipeline so that the oil can flow a little quicker. So that will increase the capacity as well. So those are, th those are ways that you can increase capacity of a pipeline without building anything extra. Uh, now, suppose you do want to build a new pipeline. There is an incentive to build it alongside an existing pipeline because typically the existing pipeline has existing right-of-ways. So it becomes uh, easier to acquire the right-of-ways to build alongside an existing line. Uh, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about how, it, like, we had a couple people asking about, like, 
the jobs that this type of infrastructure brings to um, the Great Lakes area. Could do you do you have any um, any thoughts about um, job creation? Any numbers? I have no numbers with me. Uh, in, in, a, in a qualitative kind of way, you know, I, I know that uh, both chemical plants petrochemical plants and refineries are capital intensive rather than labor intensive. And so you so so that might be the source of your question there. But they do create jobs and the jobs are generally fairly well paying jobs. And so and then with the chemical, the downstream chemicals and uh the, the products that come out of the refinery, uh those do create jobs, you know, the next level down. Thanks, Dr. Paul. Uh, I think uh, Dale had a, a few things he wanted to discuss before we um, before we end the webinar. Dale, are you there? I am there. So oh, I just wanted to thank everybody for participating in this first uh, session of the of uh, four in the series. Um, the next one is going to be understanding hazards, risks, and security. And again, it'll be about perception and the way different organizations entities and academic bodies use these terms. And um, it should be a real interesting uh, uh, webinar. So we hope you'll join that one as well. Also, I wanted to thank Dr. Hall again. Uh, it's really rare to have an expert available to answer any question you want. And it's nice that uh, he took the time uh, and made the effort to do this for us. And so I really thank him very much. And then I would final, finally say anyone that uh, um, has Dr. Hull's contact information, uh, whether you're um, an individual or a, 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 an organization. Um, he does do consulting and he, and he is an academic and he does respond to questions. So um, it was quite a treat to see that he put his contact information up there and I would encourage you all to take advantage of that. So again, thank you very much and thank you very much uh, um, Sea Grant, Ohio, for uh, putting the, uh, the webinar series physically together for us. Yeah, and, and, and thank you. It's been a real pleasure. All right, well, thank you. Thank you both for uh, coming on. Uh, I just wanted to mention that this webinar series is sponsored by the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network and the Great Lakes Commission. Uh, the webinar that uh, Dale spoke of uh, in, on April 13th, um, the registration is up, so feel free to go to the go.osu.edu crude move webpage to uh, register for that. Uh, this, it, I've also posted the webinar survey in the chat feature, so if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, that would be very much so appreciated. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for um, participating, and have a great afternoon. Thanks again, Dr. Hall and Dale. Sure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.